so we are on top of it. So it's 126. I get started. Let me get and I will get started with introducing myself. Um, some of you may already have read my bio, but just to give you just a brief intro to who I am. My name is Yvonne Aquavetter, and I'm a change management strategist, advisor, change leadership advocate, very passionate about um, change leadership and the value that change leadership can really bring to us in terms of our careers, uh, as well as the change that we can make in our community, the change we can make in our organizations, how we can help us position ourselves as leaders in our organization, in our industry, and in the marketplace. Very passionate about it. Um, I run events and conferences uh, for the Change Leadership, the founder of an organization called the Change Leadership. So we run events there. I also work with individuals, professionals, and organizations to help them lead and drive change within the organizations in their space, equipping them to position themselves to be leaders and to make an impact and difference in the organization. So do that through coaching and training and also provide online courses. So we're about to um, launch the next cohort of our online um, course for next month. Uh, so we have people signing up for that already, which is about uh, change leadership accelerator, how to accelerate your change leadership skills and competencies in your industry. But today I'm gonna to share a little bit with you about being a change leader in your industry. Um, only so much I can do in 20 minutes, but I will make sure it's packed and it's full of information for you today. So the first question I want to ask you is, why do you need to act now? Why do you need to be a change leader in your industry? There is no time like today to be that change leader. Why is it important to start to take action now? Why is change leadership such an important skill in today's business environment? And just to introduce you to the concept of it is the very first thing is organizations are evolving. Organizations are evolving in such a way where it's no longer about the hierarchies. We're beginning to see flatter organizations. Organizations are already beginning to respond to change. They are already beginning to um, respond to the marketplace, to their competitors and the way they do business. So if organizations are evolving and the structure is evolving, that also means that the responsibilities for individuals within those organizations are also changing. They're also evolving. So with flatter organization now becomes more responsibility for individuals. So it's no longer about making a decision at the top and then the responsibility for individuals across the organization is just to implement. With flat organizations, individuals are now being given more responsibility within their organization to make decisions. They're given more, being given more responsibilities to drive change within their organizations. They are being given more responsibility to be creative in the way that they are thinking. So the demand for individuals is no longer as it used to be. There is now that new responsibility which comes with you having to take more responsibility, drive change, and make a difference in your organization. Another reason why change leadership is such an important um, skill for today and competency for you to become a change leader in your um, organization is because we're now experiencing what we call the new normal. So um, what does the new normal for us mean? So I wanna hear from people on the call today. What does the new normal mean for you? When you hear the word new normal, what first of all comes to mind, especially in the context of your career? Let me see how people are feeling or in any context, you know? So we have a few people. Hi, um, Alvin just joined us. Um, Helene, thanks for joining us. So I want to hear from you guys, you know, what does the new normal mean for you when you hear that word, the new normal? Or maybe you're even tired of hearing that word, new normal. Tell me about it. <laughs> Being able to adjust quickly to change. I love that. It means remote working. Yes, that, that's another thing it means. What else does it mean for anybody? More balanced work life. Awesome. It's interesting you say that, Tijal, um, because I was reading an article the other day and it said, actually just today, I, and I've been reading that perhaps the new normal with the fact that people are working remotely from home, it means more work. 
So people feel less balanced because they're having to manage the children at home. They're now being required to sometimes work longer hours or subconsciously they're working more hours. You know, um, Colleen, I like that. It says a lot of learning. So the new normal means different things for different individuals. But one thing it means for sure is that there is a new way we need to work. There are new services being um, introduced into the organization. Online shopping has gone up exponentially. You know, there's people are more, um, there's more um, consumption of media these days. So you have new types of jobs being created. You ha you're having to work from home. There are different requirements for us. And it's just topsy-turvy. We don't even know what's happening from month to month. So that's one characteristics of the new normal is that there's a lot of uncertainty. Uncertainty with what is happening around us. And what the new normal has contributed to is what we call the future of work. It has accelerated the future of work, the new future of work. Um, they now say the future of work is now. So in the past, we're talking about the future of work, like the future of work was something conceptual in the future. But what we're beginning to see is that the future of work is now. How we do work, what tools we're using to do work, where we work, and the changing types of jobs that we have, all being driven by advanced technologies such as AI, robotics, 3D, fourth industrial revolution technologies. So if we look at that deeper, you know, and we hear future of work, would we think about remote working? Remote working was something that people um, we were being we were being told that there's going to be an increase of remote working in the future. Now we find that with the pandemic, that has quickly accelerated the future of work. From, from a remote working perspective. The future of work also spoke about how we do work, what tools we use to do work. So before, a great example that I always use is the introduction of AI and robotics. You had somebody like an x-ray technician who had to look at cancer patients' x-rays and it would take them five days, seven days, 10 days to be able to read the cancer patient's x-ray. Now that is taking AI less than a day, within a day, within hours, the AI is able to come up with the results of the cancer patient's x-ray. So what does that mean for the x-ray um, technician whose job it was focused on doing that? It's changing their jobs. So now it means that their skill set is no longer focused on just the technical side of things. Now they have to be focused more on being able to integrate AI into their jobs, being able to integrate robot things like robotics into their jobs. They're, they're having to think more about maybe um, client care. Because one of the misconceptions I have to say out there is that you get this, you know, AI is coming for our jobs, the robots are coming for our jobs. Yes, they will start to do certain types of um, roles and tasks that we used to do, but what they will also do is create new types of jobs. An example of jobs being created now is that people have to train the AI, they have to train the robotics, they have to program those things, their data analyst jobs coming, but it's moving the needle in terms of what type of jobs are being required and where we need to focus our skills on. And one of the things that um, the new normal did, or let me say more the pandemic in terms of accelerating the future of work, was to start to get us to focus more on different types of skills. Like um, there was a consideration, how do we introduce bots into the organization? That's uh, uh, an automated way of doing things. And as soon as the pandemic came, that wasn't even a discussion about how we introduce it. It was like, when are we going to have it in the workplace? When and how can we start to immediately use it in the workplace? So that's some of the ways it's accelerating it. And just to give you some stats here, um, the Gartner starts saying future of work trends post-COVID, remote working is going to go up significantly. I think we can all agree on that element. Then he talks about critical skills. Organizations are going to start to recruit less about your technical skills, and they're going to start to recruit more around critical skills that are important to the functioning of the organization. So it's not going to be focused on how great an accountant you are, or it's going to be, yes, you're a great accountant, that's standard. What are the critical skills you bring into play that will support and help the organization to grow? Those are the ways 
that the future of work trends are happening now where organizations are not just looking for your technical skills, they're looking for beyond your technical skills. And when we look at this stat, I have a snapshot here. It's not something that we'd have to go into detail here, but when we look at the stats here, it starts to show that things like analytical thinking and innovation are coming top and more important. You know, we see things like collaboration, emotional intelligence, you know, um, uh, problem solving. Those are skills that are become, beginning to become more and more important than even the technical skills, because even in my industries, technical skills are becoming a dime a dozen. The question is, how do you want to stand out? How do you want to differentiate yourself? And here are some of the skills you can start to do or some of the steps you can start to take in terms of developing your skills. And the very first one is becoming a change leader. It's developing your change leadership competences. When you start to develop your change leadership competences, and there are a number of them out there. In my course, I mentioned, I, I go in very deep into um, teaching and training on some of the 10 competencies and all other areas in terms of people managing resistance to change. You also need some of those competencies include being proactive. So the question I ask you, how proactive are you within your organization and for your career? So this is a career conference. So the first thing that you're here, you're listening to me, is that you're being proactive. So that's really great. So the question I want to ask you is, are you proactive? As a change leader, you have to be proactive, you have to be responsive, you have to be adaptable. Are you proactive in terms of understanding the trends in your industry? Do you know how the accounting field is changing? So I've used this example before, if you are an accountant and you're in the CPA area, are you seeing how AI is being used in the accounting field? Do you know that? Are you seeing the trends happening in that industry? If you're in the HR field, are you looking at the trends that are happening in the HR field in terms of how they're using technology to work now, in terms of the new types of jobs that are being created? Or are you still being traditional? Are you still using, are you still applying for roles based on your past experience? Or are you within your organization and saying, oh, I do my job really well. So because I do my job very well, I expect that they're going to um, give me that promotion that it is I need. How are you being proactive about your career? How are you being proactive about the skills that are going to be important to you in order to become a change leader? I'll tell you a very short story in terms of being a change leader. Change leadership has been able to accelerate my career in such a way that I now am a change leadership advocate. So why did I become a change leadership advocate? Because it started how many years ago when I, uh, coming out of my uh, university, 2-1, excited about my degree, what was the first thing that happened to me in, that, in the job? I got made redundant. I thought I was doing the fantastic job. You know, but there's this, that was the dot com boom, which is reflective of what we have now, the fourth industrial revolution and all of the new technologies. Then it was a dot com boom. Organizations were buying smaller organizations, just like you have organizations now buying the smaller AI organizations. Then you had the big organizations buying some of the smaller um, dot com organizations, which I was part of. And when it happened, I did not read the handwriting on the wall. Before I could say Jack Robinson, they said, hey, your job is no longer available. I'm sorry, we're going to have to let you go. I wasn't even reading the handwriting on the wall. But that was the trigger for me to start taking control of my career, is to start being proactive about my career and the decisions I made. And with that mindset to be able to do those type of things, I got into jobs whereby I was getting promotions. You know, in one, in one job, I, was, I got promoted how many steps I got three promotions within the span of a year just because I was being a change leader just because I was practicing change leadership skills just because I was being proactive about what I was doing and positioning myself in a different way so that's how change leadership is able to help your change leadership competencies is able to position you when you're seen as a change leader within your own industry and it starts with being proactive and responsive to your environment 
Another one is about focusing on your non-technical skills. So I mentioned that when it, um, this all comes under being your change, your change leadership competences. But the um, table I showed you earlier, the snapshot, you start to see things like creativity, critical thinking, emotional intelligence. Those are soft skills that you need to start to develop when you're uh, um, within your role. So even as a change management professional that I am, I've been into meetings where I knew my framework, I knew my model, how to implement change management inside out. But I got into a meeting where the client was screaming, the client was really upset. And the only thing that I was able to do to help that client was practice emotional intelligence in that meeting. And that helped me stand out and differentiate myself that that client became an ally and a sponsor for me and my progress within that organization. Another one is for you to stand out with your personal brand. So we have somebody who's going to be talking about personal um, brand today. So I, I encourage you to go for that session and you will get more in-depth information. But one of the things that you need to start to do is to differentiate yourself in this industry is to be seen as an expert in what it is you do. So it is beyond just going in and saying that I am doing my work. Are you writing articles? Are you writing blogs? What's your LinkedIn profile like? If you think you don't have a brand, you have a brand. The only difference is that you're letting the market dictate your brand. So it's either you take up your take control of your brand, step into it, and step into your authenticity. Because when 10 people have the same certifications, have the same experience, have I have all gone to um all have masters and MBA. What's going to differentiate you is how you stand out as a personal brand. And you can start to build your brand by just even publishing blogs, by having discussions with people, looking for ways to do that. So I encourage you to attend the session that is on later today so that you can learn how to stand out with your personal brand. But one of the key things I want to leave you is, is that if you look from deep within to practice authenticity to who you are, that will begin to help you stand out and shine out as a brand. That's what's going to differentiate you from other people because when, when you see red, 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 and then your personality is white, then you stand out. Or if you see white, 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 and then your personality is blue, then you stand out. So leverage your authenticity. And the three steps, if we had to summarize, because I know we're at time, um, is the key takeaways I want to leave you with, and I still have more information I will share with you, but I need you to start to think about things you can do now. Be proactive, uh, be proactive and responsive and adaptable to change. Then you need to start to think about your personal brand as critical, as something that will stand you out and differentiate you. I cannot even begin to tell you the number of opportunities that I have received not because people have seen my resume, but maybe because of what I do on LinkedIn and how I start, um, stand out and the discussions I have there or where I volunteer and do different things. So my brand has attracted them to me before they have even seen my resume. So start to think about your personal brand and also start to develop your skills as a change leader. You can go online, you can check some blogs I have out there, but how do you stand out as a um, change leader? I have these free resources that you can check out. Things that can help you stand out. Because when people hear change leader, they think they have to be a leader within their organization. No, you don't have to be a leader within your organization. You can lead change without position or title. So I encourage you to check out these free resources I have. Um, most especially leading change without position or title. If you're somewhere in an organization or community and you feel that you have all these ideas, you, you can stand out in your organization, you can make a difference in your organization, but nobody's, um, nobody's buying into your ideas, nobody listens to you. You can check out this resource I have, which is Manage Resistance to Change. It will be very helpful to show you how you can get buy-in from your stakeholders. So check out these resources, oliveblue.com forward slash um, resources. If you want to reach out to me, I have a free um, Facebook group. Um, by all means, go ahead and join that. It's just search Change Leadership Community 
on Facebook and you will find that, but you can also connect with me on LinkedIn. I would love to connect with you. I share a lot of um, freebies on there. I share a lot of tips and articles. So join me on LinkedIn, join me on Instagram, Twitter, wherever it is. If you have any questions, please, by all means, I know I'm at time, so you can send your questions to me on the Facebook group. I will more than happy at, um, um, answer your questions, but 45 minutes, 20 minutes goes so, so, so fast. <laughs> so I'm always happy to try and reduce my material, you know, just to make sure I give you a lot, but at the same time, you know, respectful of this time. So thank you so much for joining me today. If you have any questions or you have any comments, I'd like to see it in the chat box. By all means, I'm looking at the chat box. So just drop your comments. Um, I see. So Amanda spoke about the need to be flexible and guiding others through change. Awesome. Colin spoke about tolerating a lot of ambiguity. Thank you. Thanks, Kerry. Appreciate you. Thank you, Eller. Thank you. My pleasure to give my time today. Thank you for joining me. Thank you, Edgar. Appreciate it. You know, I appreciate you guys for taking the time to join my session. And if you have any questions, by all means, connect with me on the Facebook group and also connect with me on LinkedIn and let's stay connected and download the free resources that I have. That will definitely provide a lot more information and get you started. Thank you. Thank you, Sundeep, Gushala, Alvin, Sarah. Thank you guys for joining my session. And thank you, Jesse. Thanks to Toronto Jobs for having me on this session. Thank you very much. Have a great day, everybody.